Sophie. From four very different perspectives. On the crazy and unpredictable world of professional wrestling, as a pure theory creations entertainment network presents a live interactive show where you can be part of a conversation of all things professional wrestling, from the major leagues to the independents. This is Fatal 4-Way, live on Owen TV. And we welcome you to the Fatal 4-Way, live on Owen TV, along with Sean Grugel, Brian Boff, Hollywood Q, Claudel Edwards, I'm Jason Klaus. We certainly appreciate you tuning in here this week. We have a lot to talk about as uh, we have some big events on the horizon for AEW, TNA, and WWE. We're going to touch on some of that here this week. Uh, but before we get into all that, we have a very exciting Mount Rushmore, too, that is going to surely generate some conversation. And you are invited to be a part of the conversation by calling in. The, we have open lines right now at 810-228-7322. We start this week off with the apparent re retirement of one of the all-time greats of this era of professional wrestling. And for AEW fans, they're kind of torn which way, whether they saw this coming, it, this is a shock, they don't know whether this is real, if this is part of the show, what is really happening. But Brian Danielson apparently for all intents and purposes, um, Q has retired after losing the AEW championship to John Moxley at the Wrestle Dream pay-per-view. It leads this question because with the amount of the way this has been reported by dirt sheets, by reputable websites, by everybody within the industry there there is some degree of realism that this is a legitimate re retirement but if this is for this part of it a real retirement is this a guy that stays retired is this a work is this a shoot and what is going to be daniel uh, brian danielson's <laughs> legacy if this is really the end of his in, in ring career oh his legacy should be uh pretty pretty Sustained. I mean, it's, he's he's done so much throughout his wrestling career and ROH and coming over to WWE and it's crazy because like when he first got to WWE and he was working with NXT, he was already pretty much established. But he was the rookie, and The Miz was his vet. So yeah. I, I thought that was a very interesting uh, way to come in, and he had a great career. And uh, I, I I think. This is more of a, of a precautionary uh, retirement because, you know, he's going away to get a lot of neck work done. And uh, this could possibly end his career. He did say he wanted to at least slow down. Right. You know, he become part time. I, I'm not going to throw the word retirement out there at him because I think if, if he could, if this surgery and everything go go well, he's going to have maybe a couple of matches, maybe once or twice a year. You know, I can see that, you know, he's he's in pretty good shape you know so it's just the fact that he's been so banged up so beat up and he's been needing surgery for a while now brian with you when we look back on his career his wwe his his, his wwe run ended with an injury yep it was at that point this was the end of the road for him. He became the GM of SmackDown, you know, still involved, but not as as a wrestler. So when he gets when he gets cleared, he goes to AEW. There's this great big pomp and circumstance. His fan base is all excited. But now we're starting to, to see this happen again. The, the other the other flip side of the retirement angle. How many times can a guy go? this route to get that kind of emotional s support from the fan base and still make it re relevant because i'm going to be honest with you when i because <clears throat> i did not watch this show i i just saw the headlines and when i saw retirement and he lost the title and this that and the other thing i'm like i don't buy it i i am i am i'm disconnected from him 
and the word retirement. Like I'm not, take nothing away from what he's done as a wrestler. He has established a legacy, but I am not emotionally involved with this storyline. If this is in, and if this is real, it is what what it is from my perspective. I mean, it's how many times can they pull the carpet from underneath you before you're like, I, whatever, I don't believe you anymore. I mean, obviously for Charlie Brown and Lucy, it was over and over <laughs> and over again. But I think that's a big case with him, the fact that we've seen it before. I also think that it's not a cut in stone, definitely retiring. Like, I heard the same thing you were just talking about, Q, about it being a more of a partial retirement. Like, he will, mm -hmm. from time to time, or it's going to be like a Goldberg-type thing, like in case of emergency, break glass and pull out Ryan Danielson, um, especially in AEW. I could see in the future they'd be like, we need you. Right. Assuming this is real, what what does Brian do for, from here on out? Well, it's simple. Jimmy Jacobs has already stepped away from AEW as creative as a writer. We've all been talking about the AEW storyline stay lack. Who's better than Brian Danielson to come up with some sort of creative to get the ball rolling back with AEW? I mean... It, it's, you guys say no retirement. I'm saying retirement because, you know, you go online and you see these things. His last match on Raw was versus Seth Rollins. His last match on SmackDown was with Roman Reigns. His last match in AEW was with John Moxley. Shield. The Shield, you know. So I think he's done for a while. I think he's going to go into creative. I think he's going to rehab a little bit. And as a sidebar to this, I'm really disappointed in the fact that they took the title off a of swerve to give to Brian Danielson as a transitional champion over to John Moxley, who doesn't deserve the belt, in my opinion, to begin with. That was going to be my follow-up question: Was John Moxley the right guy to put the period at the end of his of his story for the time being? And as as it, as it seems at this point. Um, it's going to be in interesting t to see what they do with him moving forward. But, I, I mean, like like you were saying, like we have said for a long time here, the dude has a great mind for the business. And especially where he's at, he is in a position to really be a difference maker where they really need it. And that's behind the scenes because <laughs> what they're putting out in the ring is, in my view, um, it's disheveled at best, Q. If, 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 I mean, they have, they have moments, but that's all it is, in, in my opinion. Um, we do want to, so we wanted to make, make mention of that because, again, this guy is, a, he is an era star. He is going to be in a lot of top tens, a lot of Mount Rushmore's. You know, uh, maybe not as cool as the one that we're going to tackle later on in the show, but be that as it may. We are going to switch gears over to some up, upcoming <laughs> events that uh, are definitely on the pro wrestling calendar and on our radars, especially those here in the in the Michigan area, in the Detroit area, with TNA bringing their Bound for Glory pay-per-view to Wayne State Fieldhouse. Um, what I found interesting about this, not only are they doing the pay-per-view, on October the 26th, they're coming back the next day for a couple of TV tapings for their Impact show. And in a way to generate some interest with this cue, TNA has announced a live one night only concert featuring Jeff Hardy and Joe Hendry. And this is supposed to be the highlight of the Impact tapings on October the 27th. Now, Jeff Hardy is is known. He has his hand in a lot of you know projects. He's an artist. He, he and a musician. You know he he knows how to play a variety of instruments. Very talented too. Joe Hendry um, apparently is is a musician as well. Um, before we came on the air here, I I told the guys here I'm like I find this very very interesting because this is a low-key example of s something that I have picked up on with especially with the promotion for Bound for Glory and that is this and this is my hot take for, for the week. You look at anything with, with TNA on it right now in terms of Bound for Glory and you see a collage of wrestlers. 
You see Nick Nemeth, who is their, their world champion right now. You see Joe Hendry, who is going to be challenging Nemeth in the main event. You see the Hardys. You see Jordan Grace. Now, here's my, my take on this. At this point, Q, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Hardys need Joe Hendry to stay relevant at this point more than Joe Hendry needs the Hardys. Would you agree with that or no? I could definitely see that, yeah, because Joe Hendry has more of a upside. I mean, he, he has a future ahead of him. The Hardys got to hold on, you know. This it's, it's crazy because, you know, in the ring, we know their style. A lot of that stuff that they've been doing in the 90s, they can't really do right now. So they have to rely on character. And, I mean, Joe Hendry's character is, like, one of the hottest characters, you know, in the business in TNA right now. So that's, I think it's great for the Hardys. And plus, the Hardys have a lot to teach, you know, because they've been – They've been around. They've been to multiple companies. I mean, they've been all over the world. And they have a lot to teach a lot of these young guys that's coming up. Joe Hendry can actually learn something from the Hardys. Well, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about in a public presentation right now because the Hardys are coming off uh, their run with AEW, which really didn't really move the needle all that much. And, and in fact, if it did, it went backwards because of all the issues with Jeff Hardy and his exploits outside of the ring. Um, c coming into TNA, I mean, the Hardys are no strangers to the TNA audience, but Joe Hendry is obviously the guy that they're building this promotion around. Uh, in terms of a public pr uh, presentation, do you do you agree with my assessment at this point that the Hardys, from a public presentation only, not what they can bring b behind the scenes, do they need Hendry at, at this point? The Hardys? Yeah. I, the Hardys absolutely do need Hendry. And I'm telling you, I really hope what I see is – Take this for what you will. I really want to see Hendry elevate himself and take out the Hardys and become like a super heel because he, he does that. People who have been watching the Hardys for years, they're either going to love it or hate it. He's going to get the same type of response that like a Stone Cold Steve Austin got or a heel rock got. We love to hate you, Joe Hendry. And I think that's what it's going to wind up coming down to. If they were to make that switch, Brian, do you think it would work? Yeah, I think he has a personality to carry it out. Like, I was literally in my mind picturing him doing the yeah. thing. Like, <laughs> but in more of a joking, like, sarcastic, sarcastic ego, yeah. egomaniac type of way. And I think it would, he could pull that off very well. I think what you were saying about the who needs each other more, I, I could see it going both ways, though, too, because the Hardys carry a unique fan base among them that have, will follow them anywhere. And, I mean, that just only brings more eyes to Joe Hendry. That, that's a very good point. There, that because if a, a casual wrestling fan, especially in in the metro area here, if they were to come across a Bound for Glory poster or a flyer or something, they see the Hardys, they see Dolph Ziggler, they're, they're oh well, I know these people, so I yeah. I get that part yep. of it for sure, for sure. Um, <clears throat> and can I say something real quick yeah. about this show here? Yeah, Wayne State University. Formerly on our show during our barbecue that we had here at Orion on TV Studios, Jack Price has been announced to be on that show. Oh. So I'm super excited oh, for nice. him, and I hope he gets that push and elevation that that man deserves. Good luck to you, Jack. We're all pulling for you. That is that is phenomenal news for, for sure. Could not, happen, could not happen for a better guy, for sure. Um, before we uh, look at the the other pay-per-views here, do you want to uh, br bring everybody up to speed on what's happening with NXT real quick? NXT, man, there is a whole lot going on with NXT right now. There's a whole lot going on with Cora Jade, and yeah. you can look at older pictures and look at her now. I mean, she she uh, what was it? Not quite a girl, but now a woman or something. Cora Jade has grown up, grown has grown up, up. Uh, since her injury. She's back, uh, and. Uh, we have, uh, what's her name, Stephanie back here, Victoria, yeah. and uh, Julia, Julia yeah. and so now they're uh, going to have a tag team, those two versus Roxanne Perez and Cora Jade, who 
It's kind of weird because they were fighting when Cora got hurt, and yeah. now uh, they're back together. But uh, I don't know. Did you guys notice that NXT is kind of pulling back away from the TNA people? When was the last time we seen Joe Hendry? When was the last time we saw I think Jordan they're doing Grace? waves. I think maybe you've seen the TNA people a bunch there, and now you're seeing the NXT people more going to TNA. Yeah, because you it's were like just Maybe saying, it's going to go uh, push back and forth. Yeah. yeah, I was saying how Ariana Grace is over there right yeah. now, and Sol Ruka, I think, was supposed to yeah. is over there or is going to be. Yeah, yeah I don't, I yeah, think you don't want to do too much. I think much. they're just kind of yeah. almost like a wave. You're going to see some go there, then you're going to see more this way. I think it'll go back and forth. Yeah, the storylines are pretty much set in yeah. NXT. So right. you don't want to interfere too much, you know, bringing all the, these other people in and getting everybody all confused. And they just got to the CW, so they're still getting their footing, you know. That's a big thing, too. With When you've seen the introduction to CW, you've seen a lot of main roster people Yeah, they people use the main roster, down. yeah. But that we, would overshadow the TNA people. We do have a big debut happening tonight, guys. Yeah, um, after years of anticipation and hope and wonder, is this actually going to happen? And obviously, again, because of where we are based out of, this is very much on our radar. The Motor City Machine Guns are scheduled to make their WWE debut here tonight on SmackDown. Um, what is interesting about this, Brian and I have had a lot of conversations about this at our shoot job. Q and I have talked about it. Sean and I have talked about it. When, if, when would they get their opportunity to be on the biggest stage this industry has to offer? And the time is now. And for us who have followed them from the ranks of the independence circuit, all, moving all the way up to the pinnacle that is WWE, what was interesting is they're leapfrogging NXT altogether. They're, they're coming straight to the main roster. Yeah. And Brian, you gotta believe that is a huge vote of confidence for, for these two guys. Yeah, for sure. Do you guys feel like maybe WWE is trying to make a push for the tag team division again? Because there was the little subtle promos about Detroit for the Motor City uh, Machine Guns. Mm -hmm. We also saw it for War Raiders. They were doing the little symbol with the Viking yeah. runes on it. It seems like not only are they just introducing them back, but they're like previewing it. It's almost Vignettes. like they're trying to yeah. uplift that tag team division again. They need to. Yeah. <laughs> they need to. I mean, ever since the uh, titles were split at WrestleMania. The tag team division died a slow death. And Finn Balor and, uh, and, and JD, JD McBighead, uh, he, <laughs> they, held, they held on to those titles for all these months now and hasn't even defended them. And then you got uh, on the other show, you got, uh, I don't even know who the tag champs are on, uh, or the bloodline. Yeah, you got the bloodline, but there, there's no emphasis on the. Uh, it's not the bloodline. Team. It's not the bloodline. <laughs> B team of bloodline. Team of bloodline. Team of bloodline. <laughs> but I'm I'm actually more excited that the tag team division is getting a nice shot in the arm because we need that, and especially like down the line if we get the Lucha Bros in, you know, it's yeah. just, you're 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 building up new teams. You got teams coming up from NXT eventually, you know, so you're you're building all that up and you. You can make it nice and fresh, do and we don't have to be so stale with it. Do you think that's why they pulled back the Wyatt Six? They are mm, special, I, I guess. To they're, them, they're the special attraction. The attraction. That's yeah, they're the attraction. Yeah. That's yeah. that is how they're being. That's how they're being utilized, and that's how they should be utilized. Because if you overexpose them, they lose that magic, that that mystique. Bring them out at certain times of the year. Obviously, you know, with with. The aura of their gimmick, I don't know why they wouldn't be more featured in the fall time going into yeah. Survivor Series. Yeah, I want a little bit more. Kind of yeah. draw them back around the holidays because they don't really coincide <laughs> <laughs> coincide <laughs> with, with the holidays. But, you know, between R Royal Rumble r to WrestleMania, have them f featured there, draw them back, bring them, maybe like the big four, you know, have them f featured on the big four. That way they're spread out and, and they, they remain fresh and new. Um, 
how many examples you can do. We could do a Mount Rushmore on guys who should have been booked as attractions Heck yeah. and were way overexposed. Big Show was the first one that comes to mind when yep. he made the jump over to the WWF. <laughs> He was losing to Steve Austin on Raw with, within eight weeks of his debut. Like, what yeah. in the hell are we doing right now? Right. This guy was special, and mm -hmm. you ruined it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't want that to happen with, with the Wyatt Six. Uh, speaking of the fall time, that, of, of course, is going to bring us to the centerpiece in terms of the pay-per-view uh, uh, schedule that is going to be the, the, the Survivor Series, November the 30th. It is taking place in Vancouver, British Columbia, and because of that, here earlier this afternoon, it was announced that WWE is actually going to change the start time of the Survivor Series on November the 30th to 2.30 in the afternoon. This is unique because I the Survivor Series is one of those shows we've talked about it it has its own lineage it has its own aura it has always been an eight o'clock bell time you know start time for this particular pay-per-view and i understand they're in canada th this year and, and then they're going to broadcast this thing live as it happens um it's just it's just weird to think that we're getting more and more of these pay-per-views that are starting earlier in the afternoon now, for the, the next one in two weeks, for Crown Jewel, I believe that carries a 1 p.m. Uh, start time, but they're in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So it, they're go it's going to be an, an earlier bell time. What, what is your take on these earlier bell times for the, for the pay-per-views? Do they take away a little bit for, for you? Because I'll be straight up. I'm not happy about this. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not, not man. Yeah. It ruins all the tradition. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't want to eat dinner at 2.30 and, you know, have my wings and everything and try to watch a pay-per-view at 2.30. I, imagine if I was in California, you know, and I got to watch this thing at 10.30. You know, it's it's, it's insane. So, no, I'm, I'm not a big fan of this. I, I, the, now, the 6 o'clock when they did with the, uh, the uh, previous show, mm -hmm. that's fine. Right. That's fine. I mean, but 2.30, I mean, that's a bit of a stretch. We're talking about daytime. You know, people are out doing things. And a Saturday, you know, people got kids. You know, we, <laughs> we, we like to do stuff, you know. And it's crazy that they want to force us to, well, I'm not going to say force. but middle you know, of a like, Saturday. Right. That's the yeah, other thing. It's not, on demand. You can go back and watch it at right. o'clock. But you, you want to watch, watch it live, live right, yeah. sir? Well, you got to watch it live or else you got these dirt sheet rag reporters going on Facebook and every other form of social media giving away the finishes to the match. And it, you know, kind of ruins it for you. Um, I don't like these 2 o'clock start times, and I like going to bed early. You know, 6 o'clock is perfect, you know. But, uh, yeah, they, they, I, I understand why they're doing it because in this day and age where – information is at your fingertips at the click of a button you know you got to do it um unless they were able to black it out but there's going to be someone in that arena who's going to be like hey go post this up you know right. so, so yeah. just beat there so is and no so more blacking out right so i mean they, they got to do it i don't like it um i almost wish that the big events you know the big four were kept traditional while the other ones go ahead and you know play play around with the times but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of this at all. What's your take on it, Brian? Do you care about it? No, I don't like it at all. I mean, right now I got football with my youngest. It's right in the middle of the day, so most times I'm having to wait. And <clears throat> like you guys said, <coughs> it's not even dirt sheet reporters. I got to block my conversations with all you guys <laughs> so I don't get updates. <laughs> And I still got to accidentally make sure I don't even look at the text message things. I've actually handed my phone to my wife and be like, shut off my notifications from the fatal four away and these guys because I want nothing coming through. And being third shifters, honestly, for me, a 10 o'clock start would be perfect. Right. I watch my stuff late. I want to sit down, relax, and enjoy it. Middle of the day, I'm worrying about the kids and dinner and all these things going around. I want to be solely focused on that pay-per-view when it starts. I'm all about the traditional aspect of it, and you know the things that, as a kid, like the Survivor Series is one one of those shows that 
Man, I can remember getting excited for the very first one. We got Team Hogan against Team Andre. And, I mean, it was a star-studded lineup. And for, and it was held on Turkey Day. You know what I mean? Ooh, it was yeah, held yeah. on the actual holiday. And now they kind of got away from that in, in, in the years moving in, but it was still centered around the holiday weekend, right? right? Yeah. I'm looking at it from this perspective, like, like, if I'm, if, if, for example, <laughs> my girl is not a wrestling fan, but not she, many are. <laughs> but she will sit down and watch it with me, right? Same. So, but <laughs> if if she's going to invest that time, I want to make sure it's worth her while. So I'm going to make her like a traditional holiday dinner centered around, you know, because of the time slot, right? You know. You're giving me a two thirty bell time, and I'm I'm thinking about having to make her brunch. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. It's just not as traditional, Brian, and I'm not happy about any of this crap. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of how you're renaming different dishes to make them wrestling themed. You'd be surprised what I come I, up I, with. I, 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 I'm like just in, really interested in this. Yeah, listen, maybe I'll have you over one year. All maybe right. you, you can see how how it's all laid out. All right. Hooker with all the trimming. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a programming note, two weeks from tonight, we will be back on the air and we will be doing a deep dive preview of Crown Jewel because they are really trying to make this event mean something. <coughs> um, <laughs> <coughs> One more uh, topic of conversation before we go to break here, and this could get a little polarizing. Uh, but it really has, t you know, this headline has really taken fire this week, and that is uh, The Undertaker apparently is going to interview Donald Trump on his podcast sometime this week, which gets me to thinking the crossover between professional wrestling and politics, and is it a good mix? This could actually be its whole own episode, I realize that. But upon hearing the news that Donald Trump is going to appear on The Undertaker's podcast, Brian, what was your first thought? Obviously, they're not going to talk politics. They're probably just going to talk the hair versus hair match. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, not to go one way or another politic-wise and go down that whole rabbit hole. You're right, right. But I believe if you look at the way these candidates have been running, Donald Trump has his finger a lot more on what people are interested in now. He's been doing the podcast run. He's been on Logan Paul's, right, um, yeah. he's Andrew Schultz's. There, I mean, it's, there's talk that they're gonna maybe both candidates are actually gonna end up being on Joe Rogan's. Yet, um, I know Sean Ryan had a, uh, Trump already and said that he he's reached out to Kamala's people. Um, I think Kamala's in the point now where she's seen the difference that it's made for Trump, and now she's trying to catch back up and do some of these shows. Right now, if you want to reach that male de demographic, it's not as well much as it used to, like it is wrestling as well. It's podcast. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, yeah, it, it, I, it makes 100% sense. If you want to reach the people out there, that's the way you do it. It's not traditional media anymore. A couple of elections cycles ago, there was a large focus, a big focus on the NASCAR fan. A lot of candidates, you know, the candidates were really focusing on that demographic. I, I think back to the 2000 election, The Rock appeared at both the, the Republican and the Democratic National Conventions. He was on the, on the House floor. He was a correspondent for WWE, he yeah. and Linda McMahon. Um, Hulk Hogan made headlines earlier this year by appearing at the RNC. Is professional wrestling fans the new NASCAR fans? Are they becoming the new focus group? I don't think they're becoming the new NASCAR fans, but I think they are a focus. Um, and we'll go ahead. I, I'm not real politically he heavy either, but you know, when I listen to certain, well, I, I, like when I listen to Spotify, there's always commercials for uh, Kamala. When I go on to TikTok, there's always commercials for Kamala. Why? Because Trump has been banned from certain platforms to be able to advertise his campaign stances. So he's going out, like you said, Brian, he's got his finger on the pulse of what else is popular. 
He's had this connection with the WWE for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Wrestling is hotter than it's ever been. And I think the connection, while I might not necessarily agree with it, I think it's going to benefit Trump in the long run. And I think he will probably see a certain rise in the polls because, as you said, Q, podcasts are the future of communication. And for Trump to be able to go on very popular shows, he is going to have a more worldwide reach rather than Kamala being in the Spotify TikTok zone. Right. What's your take on this? Is wrestling and politics a good mix here? I mean, it's it's gonna mix. It is what it is. Um, is it good or is it bad? It depends on how you know we react to this thing. I mean, mm-hmm. we need easily start going at each other and saying I like this party or that party and all that stuff. But uh, really, I I agree with you with uh what Trump is doing. Um, if you think about it, the impulsive. Uh, podcast has millions and millions of followers I mean so there's a lot of eyes on that and yeah I actually thought you know uh, if you think maybe 20 years ago do you see somebody like the Undertaker interview let alone on social media I mean it wasn't a thing back then but do, have, can you picture it's the Undertaker? You look back in the day, and the Undertaker is about to interview, possibly. Well, he was a formal president, but possibly our next president. Right. That's that's huge. That's huge for his podcast. So Undertaker is really winning here. I'm going to be very curious to, to see what the numbers look like when when, oh, those, yeah. when those episodes drop and if the, the opposition is going to follow suit and uh, kind of toy with the podcast space. So that just, I found that very interesting. And I was like, man, and like you said, of all people, The Undertaker is going to be the one that, that lands this thing. So very interesting. All right, what we're going to do, we are going to run a quick timeout. When we come back, we're going to tackle the Mount Rushmore segment. Sean is going to be shooting the ropes, all that and more, when the Fatal 4-Way returns live right after this. Have you ever thought of producing your own podcast? ONTV offers the facilities, equipment, and training to help you get your own podcast off the ground. Learn how to record your show and get it out to the world. Cost is $25 per person, which gives you access to ONTV's podcast room and equipment. For more information, give ONTV a call at 248-393-1060 or visit orionontv.org today. Nine, eight, eight. Are you or someone you know having thoughts of suicide or experiencing a mental health or substance abuse crisis? 988 connects you to compassionate, confidential support for free. 988. 988 is the new three-digit dialing code for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. For years, the Lifeline, formerly known as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, has answered tens of millions of calls and helped people overcome mental health-related distress. 988 is the same trusted resource. When you call, text, or chat 988, you'll be quickly connected to trained crisis counselors who will listen to your concerns, provide support, and get you additional help if needed. There is hope. The Lifeline works. You are not alone in crisis. Just call, text, or chat 988. 988! Knowing how to identify signs of crisis in others and help connect them to resources like the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is an important way to prevent suicide in Lake Orion. For information about free suicide prevention trainings offered in our community, please visit the North Oakland Community Coalition at nocmi.org. And we welcome you back. T- <laughs> you could not. <laughs> Part <of the> exploding. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fatal 4-Way live on ON TV. We certainly appreciate you tuning in here this week. If you have a question, a comment about anything that we have talked about up to this point, the number is at the bottom of your screen. The lines are open. We would uh, love to get your take on this. Uh, 
And uh, with that, we're going to send it over to the Stan Lee of PFC, Mr. <clears throat> Brian Balf, with this week's Mount Rushmore segment. Yeah, seeing we have Halloween coming up and our next uh, show will be after Halloween, I thought we'd try to go along some type of theme there. So what we're going to do is our favorite, what we think is the like our coolest uh, mask slash face paint and wrestlers. So for me, oh, there it is. <clears throat> I went with, with I went with the Demon Finn Balor. Cool. I mean, yep, I came. I mean, I want to get one face paint in there. Uh, I went with Penta. I like Penta. Yep. Uh, that's like face paint and mask. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. I mean, same thing with Luchasaurus, <laughs> also another one. I went with that. And <clears throat> my old school boy, La Parca. I always liked the like fact that he had a hood included with his. I don't know what it was, cause I, maybe because I always wore hoodies back in the day. Mm -hmm. But there was something about it that was like, that's my boy. No, I can appreciate that. The chairman of WCW. Yes. See, and that's what I always appreciate about L La Parca. In that era, in the WCW Cruiserweight era, everybody had a mask. It was just, you know, what shape, what color. Yeah. This dude stood out because he had he had personality. Like, oh, yeah, he uh, did. He really the stood out. Dance. Yes, <laughs> man. Yep. That's what, <clears throat> when I think of him, and when I saw because you, you texted me his name, yep. and I was like, that's the first thing I thought of, the chairman of WCW with, with that whole thing. He's got the whole old school, kind of reminds you of the Karate Kid Halloween costume. Yeah. Yeah, yep. That's the original that's, La Parker there. That's there's, like, no, there was two of them. That's like Skeletor from Masters of the Universe. Mm -hmm. That's what that's. Well, it, right. The movie. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's another another reason why I always appreciate it, you know, my fanfare for, for He Man. Luchasaurus. Um, I just can't. <laughs> I know you can't. <laughs> All right, I, Sean. That guy's that's awesome. That's AEW's king. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so. Uh, now, see, now that's the real Skeletor of Mortis right there. Yeah, so, the, yeah. uh, Mortis, WCW Canyon, great worker. Yeah. Um, Vader, that mask was awesome. Uh, when he would take it down, put it on the ramp, and it would the smoke would blow out of it. It was incredible. But then when he took it off, he had the jock strap type mask going across mm -hmm. his face. Um, Muda, Muda with his new mask and his face paint is just incredible. I think that guy, uh, you know, I could never get enough Muda, especially with him and Sting when they were having their battles. Uh, now that he's older, he's got the mask. Um, you know, I, I think he's a cooler looking lizard than Luchasaurus. And then, um, then this guy here, Super Muneco, okay? So you guys are looking, oh, it's a clown, blah, blah, blah. Well. When I was younger and I was in the wrestling business, I actually used that mask for my character, Ooga Booga, because I wanted something to stand out. And that mask definitely stood out. And that mask got me booked all across the United States. So that's why I went with him, not necessarily because of who he is, but because of what he wore, because that was a big inspiration for me. First time I saw him, uh, the great Muda in that mask. I thought he was on the set of a movie. Yeah. yeah. And you and you look like, at that, I'm like, yeah. man, that is a movie prop. That is a wrestling <laughs> man. Can you imagine getting headbutted with that thing? No. 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 <laughs> imagine getting headbutted with that thing? Well, no. <laughs> if, if, that's a disqualification. If you were able to get in the ring with that thing and still maintain without it getting knocked off your shoulders, more right. power to you. I mean, that's why I didn't put Mantar on mine, but be that as it may. <laughs> Let's pull up Quad L. Edwards and his Mount Rushmore. Woo! All right. All right. So I'm going to go right to left here. Very uh, spooky. Yeah, I know. Very spooky, yeah. <laughs> So I went with Sting because that's iconic, man. It's, it's, it's and you a, went Crow Sting over Yeah, Crow Sting. Thing. Yeah, I went Crow Sting. We're Halloween. You yeah. know, so I went Crow Sting. It's iconic. I also went with Vader, man, because that, 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 that's probably my all-time favorite mask, even though he didn't wrestle in it. But just the whole presentation. And Vader was like my favorite big guy, so I love Vader. The original Kane is my favorite Kane. And... Even though it looked like he can't breathe, I mean, <laughs> you gotta love it. That, that, that's the monster right there, the monster cane. And they kind of humanized him a little bit when he started cutting the mouth out yeah. and all that stuff. And then I went with Bandito. That's a good choice. I thought I love, too. I love the design 
the fact that it has the bandana. Oh, with yeah, it. it's, it's awesome. different. I love the design of that mask. It, it stands out. You know who he is. You know what I liked about that, Kane? The, the voice thing. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, he was all yeah. burned up. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was yeah. full gimmick there. Yep. Do you think that old school cane mask was a lot like our old Halloween mask that we'd have, where you, they were just filled with the steam from breathing as you walked around with them? I, I, what is he sweating through the mask now? That's gotta be leather. <laughs> that's gotta be straight. That leather. was my biggest thing with the takeaway from those old, like, like, uh, like the plastic mask yeah. with the rubber band strap. Yep. It was like I can just remember pulling up and like shaking it because it would be so full of moisture from breathing. Yeah. I think that <clears> one and, and along with like mankind, those are, are leather based. So all that sweat is oh. Vader's too. Vader, there there are stories about Vader, not the helmet, like but the mask that he wore when he wrestled. He's the stinkiest wrestler. <laughs> oh, I heard that too. In the history yeah. of the business, because he would never wash his mask or his gear. And so, but they, they, it was a leather based m material. And I think that's what Canes was made out of too. So you, it's absorbing all that crap. To be fair, I never washed the Ooga Booga mask or the Super Muneco mask either because I was afraid that it would fall apart. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Is there, have they ever had like any stories behind the design of that, the Mastodon mask? Uh, not that I have heard of. I would now, love to hear about that. Fun fact. The Vader character was actually designed for Ultimate Warrior. Really? Yep. But uh, I don't know if John Hel was it John Helwick? Helwick. Jim Helwick. Jim Helwick. He I don't know if he like no showed or something like that. Man, ended up, <laughs> ended up falling on uh, yeah. Vader was like next in line. Or something. there's a story behind uh, the actual Vader character. Well, that was the cool thing about masks, though, because if guy didn't show up, you just drew another one. And yeah. I mean, uh, what, what was it? Um, Max Moon? It mm -hmm. was originally oh, yeah. Co Conan, and then oh, they yeah. put someone else Paul in that Diamond. one. Paul yeah. Diamond. And then, uh, let's see, you just had that happen with the the one that would run, hit the ring. Sin Cara. Sin Cara. Sin Cara yeah, you know, you had yeah. the two Sin Caras. So yeah. that was the good thing about guys in the mask. Yeah. Oh, that's and how it hides your age, too. Look at Ray. Yeah. Well, for, yeah, yeah, for sure. Honestly, Bray them. still looks young, though, <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, yeah. With, with all his mask. Yeah. All right, let's uh, pull up my Mount Rushmore here. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Lee. <laughs> Battle Cat. I haven't oh seen a picture God. of Battle Cat in years. That's amazing. Oh. Wow. Yep. Yep. It I had it. fun with this one. <laughs> <laughs> now, two of these are legit. Two of them are BS. <laughs> Which two do you think are the real ones? Out on Montoya and Battle Cat, obviously. Le uh, clearly, right? Uh, yeah. Based on what I've seen in your closet, demolition. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, pal. <laughs> You're lucky this is a family show. <laughs> obviously, Axe and Smash and Demolition uh, originally looked at as Road Warrior ripoffs by people, fans that knew of the Road Warriors that didn't watch just the WWF. Uh, but their helmets that they came out to the ring with were awesome. And, and as a kid, you're like, whoo, this, this is kind of scary. And then they would take them off and their, and their faces were all painted. Um, they, were a, they were the team that the WWF needed at the time. Perfect team at the perfect time. You know, they, they came in as heels. They made the transition to faces. Their, their entire presentation is what makes them stand out. When they were with Fuji, that yeah. was a magic pairing right there. Um, the second. They really need to go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure. Now. Um, Same thing with PJ Walker. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the Portuguese Man of War. Oh, Aldo Montoya is the next one. And listen. <laughs> If you can be a professional wrestler and make a jock strap over your face work for you, you definitely belong on a Mount Rushmore here. This is the guy that would go on, for those who are not in the loop, to go into ECW and rebrand himself as just incredible. But before that, he was the Portuguese man of war. Then there's mankind, Mick Foley. That, this, mm. This is what made Foley stand out in the WWF. This is, everybody expected Cactus Jack. We didn't get Cactus Jack, we got Mankind. 
and the entire presentation, the whole Hannibal Lecter type of feel to it, really gave Foley a new dimension in his character. And uh, look what it did for him. Three-time WWF champion, headlined all kinds of pay-per-views, is part of some of the most iconic images you will ever see in the history of this business, i.e. getting thrown off and through Hell in a Cell. And thank God he went with Mankind instead of the Mutilator. Based on the Mutilator, yep. yeah. And then there's Battle Cat. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's my <laughs> moment. <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and send it over to Mr. Grugel. Oh, okay. Oh, well, we, we we got. Oh, oh. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> That's phenomenal. What's that? All right. Well, <laughs> starting at the left, you had the Blue Marvel. Who you want to talk about heart? Like this kid had heart. What, what he lacked, these are all Michigan wrestling organization personalities and superstars. Uh, Blue Marvel, one, one of the greatest guys, really had a heart of gold, really had a great work ethic, and really cared about the company. Mad Dog Butch, uh, he, he was the bridge between the original wrestling show on ONTV and when the MWO and ONTV became partners hosted a very cool uh, interview segment called The Dog House that was uh, featured in the last few years of uh, the, the showdown live shows that we did in this very studio. I think he did one match in a battle royal, did yep. he not? Yeah, he was in the bunkhouse brawl, yeah. Um, I'm gonna skip the third one for a second and move over to Uncle Hector. You want- Ooga Booga's old tag team yeah. partner. One of the most entertaining characters in the history of the Michigan Wrestling Organization. I had so much fun working with the Uncle Hector uh, character, um, Hal, uh, and he used to, used to do a show for YouTube. Those were some of the best times I ever had. I'll, I'll be honest with you. And and the guy behind the mask, Cody Leedy, you want to talk about per perseverance and determination, hard work ethic, great mind, great heart. Cody Leedy is the man in, 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 in that regard. Current IWE tag team champions with John Campbell as, aren't they called like the party rock stars or mo monster rock stars? Something Monsters along the, rock. Something along yeah. those lines, yeah. So he has done amazingly well. And then there was uh, Skulls, it was the was the fourth one. And I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead. This is, this is when you know. Number one, you don't know what you're gonna tune into when you tune into the Fatal 4-Way. Number two, uh, for those who are looking for the definitive period at the end of the sentence in, in, in relation to my involvement with professional wrestling, I will come on these airwaves right here and now live, look in, into the camera, and admit to the world what many had already known or tried to figure out for those who were not in the loop. The dude behind the mask, behind under the hat, for the character Skulls, was indeed me. I, I know. <laughs> but that is the oh first time. God. Did you hear that? The voice I, of God was I shocked. have ever <laughs> publicly acknowledged that. And in fact. Breaking what, news here in the <laughs> Um, You know, we had to get it cr creative a couple of times because people are like, your skulls, your skulls. So we had to book Basher versus Skulls, wow. which my brother absolutely hated because he was the one that got the nod and he hated doing that. He did it because he knew we had to do it, but. Didn't Joel Snyde do it once? Too? Yep, Ra like Randy Schilling did it once. Yep. Um, and there's been a couple of people we've had to throw under, but it, what started out as a secondary gimmick turned into, like, I, I don't say this to feed my ego or anything, but the Skulls character was one of the more um, popular characters, especially with, with, with the younger fans. They they gravitated towards that character. My and son I, knew who Skulls Yeah. Was that right? Watched more YouTube, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So it was. I took. I take a lot of pride in what Skulls brought to the show. So with that, uh, Mr. Grugel, yep, shooting the ropes, shooting the ropes. Well, you already did one shoot, claim, already claiming that you were Skulls, but I already know that that was Brian Balf underneath that mask. So <laughs> yeah, I was on stilts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shooting the ropes, man. Uh, this is starting to become one of my favorite segments to do. And I kind of want to go what happened on an incident here this last week. I showed you gentlemen the video what happened with Afa Jr., who is known as Manu in the WWE with one of the Samoan teams. Actually, I heard a rumor that they were actually looking to call him up to be part of the bloodline. But now that this has happened, and we'll get into that in a minute, I don't think we're going to see him in the WWE anytime soon. And that goes with the lack of professionalism when it comes to him in the ring because he decided to, what we call in the business, shoot on a first-year rookie worker. This worker was in the ring. Uh, apparently, he was doing a Samoan gimmick, and Afa took exception to this and immediately put a whooping on him. And when I say a whooping, the kid was covered up and getting kicked in the ribs just getting beat down. And that's kind of why I want to talk about on shooting the ropes today is why are guys shooting on first year rookies? This isn't supposed to be a thing. When you're within your first year of wrestling, you're supposed to be out there learning. Now, I will go into a quick story. My very first match was against a gentleman by the name of Joey Legend. Uh, very first move, he put me in a side headlock. I put my face straight down. What did Joe do? He had to get my face up. He took his knuckles, hit me right in the bridge of the nose, broke my nose for me, welcomed me to the business. I never put my face down in a headlock again. He didn't take advantage of me. What Alpha Jr. did was took advantage of this kid in the ring. The kid was willing to give him his body, to put him over, to let him perform these moves. He trusted Alpha, and Alpha went in there and took advantage of this kid. I can understand if you're shooting on someone who has been in the business for any length of time. If they're throwing what we used to call potatoes, if they're connecting, and go ahead and give one or two of them back. If they're a first or a second year rookie, you put them in a headlock, you tell them to slow down. They do it again, then you give it right back to them. But this is the professional wrestling business. If you have a problem with someone, you take it up with them before you go through the curtain. You do not put this on display for the fans to see. Now, we've had a lot of famous shoots happen. Uh, we can talk about Anoki. We can talk about Andre. We can go on and talk about Dr. D. Uh, but in the independent wrestling business, I want to go home from the show the same way that I arrived, and that's in one piece and not hurt. Wrestlers, if you're going out there simply to put yourself over and go out there with the mission to hurt these guys, you need to duck to and get the hell out because you have no business being in the ring. A shoot, it's only determinant of one thing. If your life is in danger and you got to fight your way out of it, then go ahead, do what you got to do and leave. Do not take advantage of these kids who are going out there. He was all, you know he was already intimidated by the fact that he was in his first year in the ring with a former WWE wrestler. And now this guy is going to go out there and put a hurting on him because he is pretending to be Samoan. It, it absolutely blows my mind. And promoters, if you're booking these guys, or <laughs> I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot, shoot now. I was contacted by a promoter one time. He put a hit out on a couple workers. Called me up. Asked me to take care of business. I took care of business. My partner took care of business. These were guys that had been in the business a while who owed this promoter money for training them. I was young and dumb. Much, many years later, I went to these guys and I apologized to them. I shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it in front of the fans. If I was going to hurt these guys, I should have did it behind the curtain. And I didn't. 
And still, to this day, Dillinger, I, I apologize. You know, Mikey Zero, I apologize. We should have never done what we did in the ring. This is a new age. It's a new dawn. It's a new generation of wrestlers. We should be going home the same way we show up to the venue. Do not shoot on these kids anymore. It's not professional. And like I said, if you feel like you need to take advantage of these kids, you don't belong in the ring. You don't deserve to be in the ring. You are a part of the problem, not part of the solution. Duck to you and get the hell out. This was my version of shooting the ropes this week. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say this. The only thing, it doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter where they work, doesn't matter what stage they, they were on, it's a trust factor. You get, you're you giving your body to another human with the trust that they're going to t take care of you, and that's, that's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if that dude worked for WWE or, or not. You give your body to another human, you are responsible for their safety. That is the bottom line. If that is not your mentality, you do not deserve to be in this business. Go into MMA and try that crap there and see what happens. Q, anything going on with, with the comments? I do have my buddy Ty texted in his uh, 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 Mount Rushmore list. So I can read that up real oh, quick. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, he has Ray dressed as the Phantom at Havoc 97 versus Eddie. He also had the Vader Mastodon mask. Also went with Demolition and also had Mankind. Nice. I can appreciate that. Yep. Nice. Yeah, a lot of votes for Vader. I, you know, yeah. I, I knew that was a popular, for the lack of a better term, prop. Because, you know, that's kind of what that thing was. It's kind of achieved legendary status when, when you're talking about the more iconic props or apparel or gimmick that you're wearing out to the ring. Vader's helmet is, uh, is one that's often talked about. I just, I, I knew it was cool. I just didn't think it resonated the way that it has over the years. So, like, the majority of the Mount Rushmore's that we've heard, including mm -hmm. yours, that, that you just read, um, includes that helmet. So, that, I mean, that's a testament to what that thing wound up being. So, anyway, um, yeah, that's very cool. Uh, uh, Ain't yeah. nothing else going on? I mean, chat's blowing up over the uh, breaking news that we got earlier with the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> In case you missed it, you know, you guys hit rewind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait. I got one here uh, from Rob Jackson, who's actually in the control booth with God, um, Joe, <laughs> Joe Johnson. Uh, his masks are L.A. Park, The Great Muda, Jushin Thunder Liger, That's and Ray Mysterio. You know, you talk about Ray Mysterio, it's like, which one? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy has got like two thousand yeah. di different masks. The, he could have his own Mount Rushmore. Different Rush characters. Yeah, you know, he wears like the Joker mask he had on. You know what's one I was thinking about, and it just popped in my head the the other day when he came out at uh, Re at WrestleMania in back to back years. He was the the Daredevil one year and Captain America the next. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that is really cool. <laughs> and then I found, and I'm not a big Ray Ray fan, but. I found myself looking forward to what character is he going to be yeah. at WrestleMania. And Joker, the Joker one was cool. Isn't that when he beat JBL for the, the Intercontinental yeah, Champion, yeah. United States Championship? In like one minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tune in in two weeks for our next edition of Fatal 4-Way live exclusively on Orion Neighborhood Television.